I'll ask everyone to please be seated at this time. We are about to begin services for Mr. Michael Finnegan. Just as a gentle reminder, if you have a cell phone with you this afternoon, please place it in the silent mode or turn it off completely. That would be appreciated. Officiating, officiating at today's service is Rabbi Andrea London and Cantor Kyle Kotler. The psalmist taught, Shviti Adonai Lenegdi Tamid, Ki mimini balamot, lechen samach li bi viegel kivodi, ach bisarishkon the vetach. I have set the eternal always before me. God is at my side, I shall not be moved. Therefore does my heart exult and my soul rejoice. My being is secure. For you will not abandon me to death, nor let your faithful ones see destruction. You show me the path of life. Your presence brings fullness of joy. Enduring happiness is your gift. As we gather together on this very somber day to bid farewell to our beloved Michael Finnegan, a man who lived life with such gusto and such love, in this holy space that Michael saw as his spiritual home, where he contributed his heart, his soul, his artwork, even his carpentry. Before we built this new bima a number of years ago, we wanted to have a lower place in which we could lead services from, and I knew the only person we could get to do it right would be Mike Finnegan. And he built our first low bima here for us those many years ago. But we also gather together on St. Patrick's Day. And Mike was of Irish origin, as I think many of you know. His parents, Ed and Melinda, sitting in the front with green to represent that part of his heritage. And so in this holy place, we recognize the entirety of his identity as we pay tribute to his wonderful, albeit too short, life. Death has taken our beloved Mike. Our friends grieve in their darkened world. In their silence, there is lamentation. In their tears, there is loneliness. Lost in their sorrow, may they find the presence of loving friends. Hear them, O oh God, be with them. For Mike's love that united us in life and which death cannot sever. For his companionship that we shared along life's path and which continues through the tenderness of memory. For the gifts of his heart and mind that brought us joy and happiness and is now a precious remembrance. For all these and more we give our thanks to God. In this time of grief, we listen to the voice of our sacred scriptures. As the cantor will now chant for us, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Adonai roi lo exar pino te yasher bitzeni al mei menuchot al mei menuchot yena haleni nafshi yeshovev yeshovev yancheni bemag letzedek yancheni bemag letzedek 
למען שמו. גם כי אלך בגץ על מוות, לא אירא רע, כי אתה עימדי. שבטך ומשענתך, המה ינחמו. הארוך לפני, לפני, שולחן נגד צורריי, דישנת ושמן ראשי, כוסי רוויה. אך טוב החסד ירדפוני, כל ימי חיה, כל ימי חיה. שבתי בבית אדוני לאורך ימים. אדוני רואי לא אחסר, אדוני רואי לא אחסר. I'd now like to invite Mike's sister Malia to read Psalm 23 in English. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine en enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. לידה היא ראשית ופטירת תכלית, החיים כמסע הם, כליחה כצמיחה משלב לשלב. Birth is a beginning, and death a destination, but life is a journey, a going, a growing from stage to stage. From childhood to maturity and youth to age, from innocence to awareness and ignorance to knowing, from foolishness to discretion, and then perhaps to wisdom, from weakness to strength, or strength to weakness, and often back again, from health to sickness, and back we pray to health again, from offense to forgiveness, from loneliness to love, from joy to gratitude, from pain to compassion, and grief to understanding, from fear to faith, 
from defeat to defeat to defeat, until looking backward or ahead, we see that victory lies not at some high place along the way, but in having made the journey stage by stage a sacred pilgrimage. Birth is a beginning and death a destination, but life is a journey, a sacred pilgrimage made stage by stage from birth to death to life everlasting. And now we take these precious moments together to share the sacred pilgrimage that was Mike Finnegan's life. As we begin to reflect, I would like to invite his son, Joey Finnegan, to speak. Hello everyone. I want to start off by asking you all to do some visualization with me. Think of the times you've been hugged and felt the comfort of the other as much as they have of you. The times when you know that the season has changed by the smells and feels of the air. The times you've listened to a song and felt so helpless yet so powerful. The times you've seen the blue sky and it has sucked you in with it. The feeling of water holding your skin as the sun reflects off the waves of the ocean. Feeling the smile of someone else filling you up that you can't help but smile back. The feeling of a breath entering, staying, then leaving your body. These things I had you visualize was what my dad embodied. True beauty, sensitivity, honesty, and the power of love. He wanted to create love just as much as he wanted to share it with you. He always embraced life, even to his very last bodily breath. Writing this is painfully difficult. There is so much I want to say and could say. And what makes it harder is knowing how articulate my dad is at delivering stories and speeches. But I do feel like I need to try because I know how much he would want me to. I feel the need to tell a memory of my dad, yet it is so hard to sum up my dad with the memory. It is impossible to sum up how much he impacted me and who I am. However, I can tell you a story about his art. His art was how he expressed how much he loved life. And that expression sure came close to how much he loved me my mom, my sister, and the world he had. In the living room of my house, there hangs his largest art piece, titled Never Complete. It's probably his most architecturally complex piece in which it is constructed of bent, vibrantly painted wooden boxes to form an almost complete circle. He said that as a carpenter, the most challenging thing he constructed was a spiral wooden staircase. And in this piece, he implements many of the same techniques in which he implemented in making that staircase. But beyond the structure of it, there's a story to this piece, just like all the work he's done. And also a song to it, just like many of the pieces he's made. Last October, a few months after, after his diagnosis, he told me the story. I believe it was in the late 2000s that he made this piece. But before this, he had gone to Seattle to see his friends who were having a particularly challenging time. She was struggling with cancer and my dad had found it quite sad to see what she was going through. However, one thing that she was loving was the Flaming Lips album, Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots. My dad had never heard of them, and when he got back to Evanston, 
He lied in bed and listened to it. And then he heard the song, Do You Realize? He played it over and over and over again. And that was when he conceived of this piece. He realized that he was going to make an art piece that would blow everyone out of the water. A piece that mixed his creativity with his skill, binded by love. He was going to show everyone how good an artist he was. He had to make a piece for a gallery in which other local artists would be showing their work as well. And he wanted to make it so good that no artist would want to put their art, art up next to it. <laughs> I tell this story because my dad loved art. Not only for what it was, but for what it can do to people. The power it has to ignite a sensation of a feeling that is so unexplainably intense that you ask yourself, what is it that I am feeling? A feeling like the things I had you visualize. He always showed his appreciation for life and he always embraced it like a hug. Like the ocean, like the sound of music holding you. It's quite poetic that this piece is titled Never Complete. He died next to us right near the empty gap in the circle of this piece. I think if you asked him if a piece of his was complete, he would never say it was. But what is complete when it holds so much love and so much power? It breaks the barriers of time and space. Dad, I remember being so frustrating at times working with you in the studio because of how much a perfect perfectionist you were and how much dedication you would put into the art you made. But it taught me a lot about how to live life, how to truly dedicate yourself to it. Since your diagnosis, I have embraced the situation as much as I could and will continue to embrace the moments I have. Your life is not complete, but it never would have been knowing you. But I can promise you that you sure dedicated your all to it. I can promise you that I will embrace the love life has to offer just as much as you have. I think the song, Do You Realize, hit you so hard because you truly felt it. As the chorus goes, and instead of saying all of your goodbyes, let them know you realize that life goes fast. It's hard to make the good things last. You realize the sun doesn't go down. It's just an illusion caused by the world spinning around. I love you so much, Dad. And I'm so blessed to be part of your life. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite Mike's friend, Carrie Miller, to speak. be honest with you. I don't want to be here today. I don't want to be here talking to you because I don't want any of this to be true. But it is. And the fact is I have to be here. We all have to be here. Because Mike Finnegan is gone. And we loved him without end. My story with Mike is not unique. Any of us could have stood up here today and shared their own story of how the beauty and light of Mike's life shone on them 
and made their lives richer. Nina and I met Mike and Nancy at a block party one summer evening, probably around 20 years ago. It seems like ages. We lived on the same block, and Nina and I had even put in a bid on the house that Mike and Nancy bought. But a few years later, Nina and I found ourselves in a different house on the same block and at a block party on a beautiful summer night. And while our kids ran around and finally got to ride their bikes right down the middle of the street, Nina and I sat down to have dinner and talk with Mike and Nancy for the first time. We connected immediately, but that's not a surprise. That's who Mike was. Never pretentious, always open and warm, inviting, and ready for a conversation. And the four of us became close friends over the years, sharing meals, the successes and struggles of our children, listening to music, laughing, sitting around a kitchen table, trying to remember every song that we could possibly sing from the 70s, going to plays together, but most memorably, just talking like we did on that first night. Mike and I had some obvious things in common. The two of us, along with JR, Sharon's husband, were not born Jewish but we each met and ultimately married strong, beautiful Jewish women. We converted and embraced Judaism and raised our families with a deep connection to that long and beautiful history. We were both huge music fans, although Mike could play and read music and had a far deeper understanding of music than I did. We both loved art, although Mike could paint and created many beautiful works of art that hang in my house and probably in many of yours as well. Mike experienced a condition called synesthesia, which is a condition where your senses intertwine. And for Mike, it meant that he would actually see music as it was playing. Now, quoting from him, from his website, he said, I eventually realized I don't just listen to music, I see it. I see color in music, I see pulse in rhythm. It's physical to me, something I can touch. And he tapped into that with much of his art, which for him was often a visual translation of the music he loved. We both loved jazz guitarist Bill Frizzell and saw him together many times. And Mike made a series of paintings named after Bill Frizzell's songs. He was so excited by this and the inspiration that Frizzell's music gave him that he reached out to Bill and they became real friends. Mike went to his house and hung a piece named after one of Bill's songs in Bill's house. There's another copy of that piece in hangs in my house. And I'm reminded of the times when Mike was asked to talk about his art at a gallery opening or an exhibit and I don't know if you'll agree with me, but it always felt to me that although Mike had such a clear vision of his art and what he was creating, but when he was asked to explain his art, to me it always felt like Mike struggled to take all of those deep thoughts and emotions that drove his creativity and put it into simple language, as if his thoughts and feelings were too big to actually put into words. When I think about Mike, when I think about standing here and trying to say something profound about the way that Mike touched my life, about how he touched all of our lives, I too feel that my thoughts and feelings for Mike are too big to actually put into words. So I'll just tell you what I can. He was a loving and devoted husband. I'm not sure I know anyone, anyone who loves their partner more than Mike did Nancy. He was a tremendous father and family man. He deeply loved Lily and Joey and spoke often of how he admired their courage and drive and of how excited he was to see them make their mark on the world. He had a tremendous smile. He was big and strong, but he was such a gentle person. He never tried to take over the room. He never tried to put the attention on himself. He was always ready with a compliment. 
He was humble. He was a great listener, and someone you knew deep in your soul would always be there for you when you needed him, and would always do anything he could for you. He was a true mensch. He was kind and considerate, and everything I ever saw him do was done with honor and integrity. He was the best friend you could ever have. When I feel hard times and despair, as I do today, I'm reminded of one of my very fa favorite poems by Wendell Berry, a Protestant farmer from Kentucky whose poem somehow ended up in our Jewish prayer book. <laughs> it's called The Peace of Wild Things, and it goes like this. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. And for a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Wendell Berry evokes the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. And when he is able to be with them in peace, he finds momentary relief from our human condition. I think he's saying that in a way, we humans sometimes feel cursed with that of forethought of grief. I don't think I have ever felt grief more strongly than I do today. But standing here, I'm also struck with the feeling that the forethought of grief exists for us only because we have that essential human feeling of connection, of love, and the blessing of knowing and loving others. And as deep as my grief is today, as deep as the grief we all feel, it's only that deep because of the beauty and love that we got from Mike. When he was sick, I was blessed to be able to spend time with Mike and talk with him about music and art and life. And sometimes he surprised me. Like the time when he said, you know, I got to tell you something. I may have gone a little too far. I told Nancy, and I think it kind of changed her opinion of me, but, but I really love hollow notes. <laughs> it's true, he said. But we also talked about what was happening to him, and he was always direct and honest about what he was going through and how he was feeling. And it's not a surprise, given everything he was enduring, the suddenness, with which it hit, the fact that he was so young, that he told me that he was scared, that he was tremendously anxious about what he was going through. But one time when we were talking about this, he paused and he looked at me and he said something incredibly beautiful. He got a sparkle in his eye and he said, you know, I wake up in the morning next to Nancy and I think about her and Lily and Joey and I think to myself, if I can just wake up next to her for a little while longer, if I can have them with me for just a little bit more, that would make me the luckiest man in the world. And in subsequent conversations, even as he got weaker, that word, lucky, kept coming up. He was always, always talking about how lucky he had been in his life. And I have to admit, when I first thought about today and being here and standing here in front of you, lucky was the farthest word from my mind. But I believe that if we think not about how he left the world, but how he lived in it, if we think about those who he loved and who loved him, then I think I can start to understand how he could use the word lucky in spite of all that he was facing. I know that I, and I'm sure I speak for all of us here today, can look up at the sky and honestly say that I've been one of the luckiest people in the world to have been able to know 
and have my life touched by Mike Finnegan and to have had the honor of having been able to count Mike among my friends. <laughs> Mike Finnegan's gone. I loved him. We loved him. We all loved him deeply. May his memory be in our hearts forever. Now I'd like to invite Mike's nephew, Ari Contarato, to speak. I need to start off by stating aloud how this still feels impossible. Can it only have been last summer that Mike was sprinting into the ocean, feet ahead of the rest of us, head first into the water? I had the privilege of being Mike's nephew for all of my life as far as I can remember it. As an uncle to me, Jesse, Jake, and Noah, and as a member of our family, Mike was a necessary counterweight our family can be earnest and serious. And Mike brought a lightness and wryness, always ready to laugh at himself and at the rest of us. More than that, though, Mike was a mentor and a role model for me, an exemplar of how to live a life well and fully, to actually live it. We truly enjoyed spending time together, whether in his studio, at a coffee shop, or canoeing with my dad and Jesse in the pouring rain for eight days through the Quetico. We shared mutual loves of art, Tom Waits, the word cattywampus, John Cage, Herman Hesse, milkshakes, road trips, cribbage. He shared his joyous vision of the world with me, offering me guidance and unequivocal support in everything I took on. And he would challenge me, too, to be more than I expected of myself. Mike was my first boss. In high school, Mike hired me to help him first to build his studio, then as a studio assistant, and later on odd jobs from house painting to a few sweaty, dusty weeks spent cutting and hauling concrete out of his basement. Before that, I didn't know what it meant to be a hard worker. For someone who valued waves and water and flow and jazz, Mike sure valued structure, <laughs> both literally and metaphorically. As I put up drywall or sanded his unpainted pieces, I learned how to be disciplined, to take pride in my work without cutting corners. Mike hired my friend Spencer, too. And between the two of us, you probably couldn't have found a less skilled pair of manual laborers. <laughs> and yet, Mike set us to work on his art and on his house. <laughs> and he shared his creative experience and vision with us in the process. This sharing was an essential part of Mike's way of relating to other people. Mike was curious and open and always ready to learn. I'm sure most of us can think of something that he got into, whether it was poker, fishing, juicing, karate. He would read everything he could about it. And he would not just read every dense theoretical paper I would write and send to him. But a few years ago, after I'd been featured in a blurb in a newsletter at grad school and mentioned a book that I liked, an obscure work of anthropological theory, Mike happened to read the blurb, went out, bought the book. Several weeks later, I received an email. He had read the book slowly, then he reread it, and now he had some questions he was excited to ask me. <laughs> he was unjudgmental and approached everything and everyone with the same sense of openness. No one and nothing were too big or too small. 
He told people to honor their ideas and their inner selves. He would check in on me and my friends, which is truly astonishing. I just want to point out that no one expects every uncle or family member to check in regularly, but to check in on your nephew's friends, that is a commitment to people that is truly beautiful, and that was absolutely Mike. Six or seven years ago, Cecilia, my partner who is also an artist, was going to be in a show and needed some wooden structures in which to display her pieces. I called Mike to ask him how to go about building boxes that look professional enough to be displayed in a gallery. He talked me through every step, from what to buy, where to buy it, how to build it, how to paint it, and then he insisted that he would build them himself and overnight them to us in California. Mike loved having another artist in the family. I want to close with something Mike wrote to me a few years ago, which I think captures everything I've been saying. So this is now in Mike's words. It's funny for me to think that you're at the same age as I was when I lived in Maine. Being around 30 with no college degree and no girlfriend was scary. Plus I owed like five years of back taxes to the IRS and had terrible teeth problems. <laughs> also, I felt like a quitter because I gave up on my guitar and music. I did have art. Somehow I was lucky enough that Nancy waited for me to get my shit together, kinda. Fi you'll find your place in life and your struggles might just turn into something beautiful that you can't even imagine now. It seems to me that you've always looked for your own unique path in life. I can relate to that. We're lucky we have family and loved ones who encourage us to make our own decisions. We live those choices, bad or good, and grow with the help of others. I believe you're going to find a life of fulfillment and happiness, and you don't even know what that's going to look like. It really helps to count your blessings, even if it sounds so effing trite. Also lately, I've received a renewed sense of peace from looking at and thinking about the stars in the night sky. Love, Mike. Having had Mike as an uncle, a friend, a mentor, and a role model would count first and foremost among the blessings in my life. In our last conversation, I told Mike that he was my greatest role model and one of the most impactful people in my life. He showed me, all of us, how to live a life while being fully present for it. He modeled for me and for people in his life that you can be successful and true to yourself as an artist and still prioritize your family and your relationships. He and Nancy created a plan to have it all, and they did it. He was present, always there for Lily and Joey and Nancy, and still had the focus and the work ethic to make amazing pieces. He crafted his life with the care and precision he emphasized in everything he did. And just as in his art, he created something that is colorful, musical, and beautiful. Love you. Now I'd like to invite Mike's daughter, Lily, to speak. My dad was my biggest mentor. I have always looked up for him for guidance. There is no one I felt as similar to as my dad. He had the utmost passion to create and explore, always curious, obsessive about what he does. His identity as an artist was not a choice, but a way of being. He simply had to make art, 
That's who he was. I believed he passed this desire down to me. I strive to emulate his passion and love through the art I make. Any time I would have a performance, he would tell me to show them how much you love it. He taught me that no one can question your genuine love of something. You don't have to be perfect. Mistakes are part of honesty. He embraced this aspect of life. He was fully himself at all times. He was able to balance not worrying about his image to caring deeply about the impact he had on people. I was lucky to have a music-filled childhood. For my parents' support, I started playing drums. My dad was with me every step of the way. I could always feel how proud he was. There was never a time when he didn't want me to play drums, unless it was very late and would disturb the neighbors. <laughs> he claimed he always loved to hear me practice, which is slightly hard to believe, as even I wouldn't want to hear someone bashing on the drums all day. I told him about every musician I played with, every gig I performed in, all of my inspirations and goals. He was so genuinely excited to hear about it. I have bounced pretty much every idea, question, and concern about being a musician off him. As an artist, he understood me like no one else. He got the in intricacies and uncertainties of wanting to center your life around art. My dad was truly free of categories and genres. A style or theory in itself can never encapsulate his art. He passed that down to me. I've been exposed to all types of music, art, movies, and books, and it was never a surface level understanding. He encouraged me to dig deeply into the lives of these inspirations, fully nerd out. I found a text from him while I was at jazz camp in high school. It read, Hi Lily, I hope you're having a good time. Do they have any workshops for punk drumming? <laughs> Bikini Kill and Dead Kennedys jam sessions? <laughs> Iggy Pop Abersol play along records? This is a glimpse into how truly cool my dad was. <laughs> <laughs> To connect my love of punk rock and jazz that sometimes made me feel like an outsider was unbelievably validating. Anytime I felt unsure or uninspired, he would tell me to follow what I love, what draws me in. This seems like obvious advice, yet most people do what they think they're supposed to do and like, rather than what lights their passion. And sometimes that can be scary to admit you're into something because it can take such control of your life. This honesty has led me down so many paths and to so many treasures. As you can see, my dad nurtured my passions. We are both strongly emotional people. This undoubtedly led to some clashes. <laughs> but more importantly, he supported me through everything. Strong emotions can often lead to high anxiety. I've dealt with anxiety all my life. I know my dad have, had similar feelings. After all, it runs in the family. <laughs> Every step of the way, he was there to assure and support me. When I was little, I can remember him rubbing my back, singing and sleeping next to me when I had trouble falling asleep. There were moments from kindergarten through 12th grade when I was so panicked that he would come to school in the middle of the day to see me. Maybe I would use the excuse of forgetting my lunch or being sick, but he was nevertheless there. During college, when I was going through a hard time, he came up to Madison and slept on my apartment bedroom floor. When I was completely overwhelmed living on the East Coast during the pandemic, he was always a phone call away from comfort and soul-searching conversations. This last year was particularly challenging, and I know the same goes for my dad. He has always been there to tell me I will be okay. But how can I now assure him of this when he has incurable cancer? Is it fair to tell someone that they will be okay in the midst of tragedy? After all, we don't have control over much and anything is possible at any moment. Um, 
This led me to wonder if it was just something he would say to comfort and protect me, as any parent should do. Maybe as I grow up, I will come to terms that this is a lie. But when he was in his final months and days, he assured me that everything would be okay. When confronted with mortality, he still believed that life would continue to be beautiful, whatever may happen. And he assured us, partially inspired from his multiple ketamine trips, <laughs> that he knew our family would be okay, more than okay. He taught me that it was okay to feel scared and sad, okay to not be okay. Maybe dying is even okay in its horrible, not okay way. We are connected to the earth and the nature around us, which is constantly changing, possibly the only constant. I'm not sure if this totally makes sense. I'm still trying to figure it out myself. But I do know he instilled a strength in me to get through anything. My dad was wise and a great teacher. He wanted to pass down what he learned through his experience with cancer in the most generous way. This shows just how incredibly compassionate he was. I will know I will keep learning for him, from him for the rest of my life. His voice and support will always be a part of me. While he left much too early, he left us with a base of wisdom that will last lifetimes. I feel incredibly grateful to have had him as a dad. He was the greatest father I could have ever asked for. I love you so much. Now I'd like to invite Nancy to speak. I think I'd first like to start with just thanking everyone for all the love and support we've had. As a third year Jewish medical student, Michael Finnegan was not the man I was supposed to fall in love with, but fall hard I did. Mike, who was to become my husband and the father of Lily and Joey, captured my heart because he was a passionate, fun, and caring person who saw the world in such an open and unique way. He was different than me. He had a depth of knowledge about things that I did not like art, music, and nature, and was able to build and create with vision. He gave his full self to whatever he chose to do. None of the moderation and weighing of options that was such a part of me. He went all in. A few years after we met in Chicago, we ended up in Seattle, where we had the opportunity to build our relationship, discover a new and beautiful part of the country, and make my lifelong friends. For those who don't know, being in a relationship with a medical resident is not always fun or easy. But Mike adjusted to it and supported me while creating his own community. He also made me realize how lucky I was to have an opportunity to fully submerge myself into my passion of medicine and becoming a doctor. During this time, I got to know and love his family. It is from his mother, Mindy, whose roots in Hawaii, with roots in Hawaii, where he got his intuitive nature, his creativity, his love and appreciation of music, and his ability to connect deeply with people. It is his father, Ed, who grew up in Maine and New Hampshire, who is a source of Mike's analytic reasoning, his spirit of adventure, and his ability to completely immerse himself in whatever he was doing. Mike's sister, Malia, who lived for a time in Chicago and Seattle, 
where I got to know her and understand how she inherited these same qualities just in a different configuration. Malia, who I feel so fortunate to have as a sister-in-law and friend. I've been so lucky to be part of the Finnegan family. They've always been fun, interesting to be around, and full of love. After coming back to Chicago and getting married, we embarked on a busy time, starting new careers, bringing Lily and Joey into the world, and eventually settling back in Evanston. Mike embedded himself into my close-knit and extended family. A little overwhelmed at first, he ended up building strong and deep relationships that he truly cherished. He and my father, let's say, had a rocky start, <laughs> but they grew to love each other deeply. I was pretty certain that there were many times when my dad came to visit my family, but I actually wanted to hang out and talk with Mike. My sisters gained the brother they never had, while Mike was the brother-in-law, uncle, and cousin who always wanted to hear about everyone's plans and ideas, truly feeling the pride they achieved. As our own family grew, Mike and I committed ourselves to first and foremost being there for Lily and Joey, while allowing each other to commit to careers we were passionate about and doing it in a way that was not always traditional. Mike was often the one doing school pickup and created a way to make uh, art that allowed him to be there when the kids were home. He relished the fact he was able to be so involved in their lives, supporting and guiding them through life and seeing them for who they truly were, continuing to teach them and feeling so much pride. One quality of Mike's that attracted me him, to him from the beginning was that he noticed people truly looked at people, listened to people, and thought deeply about them. He noticed when someone changed their hair or what, the, or what they were wearing. He told me he liked my eyebrows when I first met him, <laughs> and that was before people talked about eyebrows. <laughs> but more than that, he listened to what people said and thought about it, thought about them, and usually made them feel heard. As Mike's dad said, Mike left people feeling better than before they met him. On August 1st, Mike was diagnosed with an illness that was both cruel and destructive. Despite treatment, he was incapacitated by it, losing much of his vision and ultimately his life. But despite all that he was going through, he continued to work on exploring new ways of making art and even began to write songs. He shared stories of his life with family and friends and continued to feel the pride and love for those he was close to. He often said how lucky he was to have the support of so many people and to have lived such a good life. He faced his illness and death as he had faced his life, with honesty, with openness, and with grace. He continued to teach me how to live and how to love until his final days. And for that, I will be ever, forever grateful. How much in life is precarious and unsure? Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav said it in these words Kol haolam kulo gesher tsar maod, veikar lo lefachet klal. The whole world is a very narrow bridge. It's important not to be afraid. That narrowness can hem us in. That narrowness can also be a sense of surety and security. But it is also a representation of that which we don't know. 
Mike was somebody who continued to walk forward on that bridge despite trepidation, despite the difficulty, and was able to feel the security of loving family and friends, the beauty of his art and of nature. As Lily said, there was anxiety and there was difficulty, but he faced it with integrity and honesty. And in that way, set a model for all of us about how to walk on the narrow bridge of life. The whole world is a narrow bridge. Kol haolam kulo Gesher tsar meod Gesher tsar meod Gesher tsar meod Kol haolam kulo Gesher tsar meod, gesher tsar Head clal ve hai kar ve hai kar lo le fa head clal. We've heard so many incredibly beautiful and poignant stories and examples about how Mike saw the world through his artistic eyes. His parents and his sister talk about how Mike was creating from the time he was very little. Macrame, embroidery, wire sculpture, having Grown up in Hawaii, he even designed and made and painted his own surfboards. Friends could always count on Mike to replace a toilet or fix a door for them. And he began a tradition in his family to have skit nights where everyone would sing, dance, or perform for each other. One year, he made antlers for his dog to make him into a reindeer for skit night. I think everybody here knows what a brilliant visual artist Mike was and his love for music. He played music when he was younger, but then focused his creative energies onto his art, but liked to make art pieces, as we've heard, based on music. And Mike's Art was pure expression. I think it was Joey who said it, honesty and beauty combined. And he was a learner his whole life. Ari spoke so beautifully about reading some piece of anthropology because he had seen that his nephew had read it. But he was a person who would dig deep and he would read about everything so he could really gain knowledge. If there was a musician he liked, he would read everything about them. And he also loved Harry Potter. He and his sister-in-law, Ellen, shared that love. And they once had a conversation with her about what Patronus they would be. Mike had that philosophical and playful way about him. Mike had a good childhood, and his parents, as his parents shared with me. Skateboarding, sailing, surfing, good friends, a great big brother to Malia. 
once giving her his ice cream cone when she dropped hers. But it is illustrative of his character and how nice he was to her friends. And then moving to Chicago and that party that changed his life when he met his beloved Nancy. Years in Seattle and back to Chicago and raising Lily and Joey. And we gather together today and pay tribute to a life so well, so deeply, and so completely lived. Malia, to an older brother that you shared your childhood with, who had so much kindness for you and for others. What a gift to have a sibling like that in your life. Ed and Melinda, I don't know what to say to you. No parents should ever have to bury their child. I am so, so sorry for your loss. But there's so much that you are proud of, I know. A wonderful, wonderful son, who, as Nancy shared, took after both of you so incredibly beautifully. An analytical mind and someone who was also comfortable with his feelings and sharing openly his love, embodying the best of what you gave to him. Respectful and kind. Well, and as you said to me, he was a special person right from birth. Nancy, your partner for so many years, you and Mike, such an amazing couple together. The way you raised your children, the way you shared your life together, the way you supported and loved each other for your similarities and your differences, so incredible. Lily and Joey, as you spoke so beautifully about him being the best dad. And they taught you to be true to yourselves, to be comfortable in your own skin. Even if he pushed you hard sometimes to follow your passions and to perfect your skills. When Joey, you told me that story about how you sanded and sanded and sanded something until you thought it was absolutely perfect, and then your dad said, go back and do some more. But with so much love, and integrity he taught you to live your lives. And so as we reflect today on the legacy of Mike Finnegan, first of all, of course, his most important legacy are his children, incredible children. The way you spoke today, oh my. I can see your father beaming at you, as he always did. So much heart so much soul, just like he had. And he taught us to embrace life and to love deeply, to follow and be true to our passions, to respect and enjoy the beauty of nature and each other. And as all of you have said in the family, being with Mike made you a better person because of how he lived with such integrity and love and talent and skill and passion. Rabbi Hillel taught 2,000 years ago, the Makom She'en Bo'anashim, in a place where there are not people who behave correctly, in a place where people who behave badly, you need to strive to be a mensch. Mike Finnegan was that mensch but he didn't even need to strive to be it. It seemed to come so naturally to him in the way that he lived, in the way that he loved, in the way that he created his art. His memory is truly a blessing, as his life was. Oh God, we pray that he will rest in peace and that as we remember him, when we hear music, and get completely absorbed in the stars or in the sunrise, that we will feel Mike's presence in our lives, urging us to follow our passions, to love more deeply, and to live a life of integrity. We are so blessed to 
have been touched by the life of Mike Finnegan. And now we're going to take a moment to offer a silent prayer in our own hearts for Mike and for his family. God, give us loved ones and make them the strength of our life, the light of our eyes. They depart and leave us bereft on the lonely way. But you are the living fountain from which our healing flows. To you the stricken look for comfort and the sorrow laden for consolation. Oh God, we see life is through windows that open on eternity. We see that love endures and the soul endures as you, O God, endure forever. We see that the years are more than grass that withers, more than flowers that fade. They weave a timeless pattern in a world that is a dwelling place of your love and of your glory. I now invite you as you are able to rise for El Malay Rachamim, the memorial prayer. El male rachamim shochein bamromim hamtzei menucha nechona tachat kanfei hashchina im kedoshim uteorim kezor harakia Et nishmat Yitzchak ben Avraham v'sara shehalach le'olamo ba'al harachamim yastirehu b'seter kenafav le'olamim ve'yitzoror yitzoror hachayim et nishmato. Adonai hu nachalato Ve'yanuach b'shalom Al mishkao Ve'nomar Compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to Michael Finnegan, son of Edward and Melinda Finnegan, who has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let him find refuge in your eternal presence and let his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is his inheritance. May he rest in peace, and let us say, Amen. Please be seated. The interment will take place at Westlawn Cemetery in Norwich, and our procession will form in the parking lot. Please keep in mind two important safety features while in procession. One is to use your bright headlights, and secondly, please use your emergency flasher lights as well and stay as close as possible to the car in front of you with, with safety allowance, of course, um, to avoid large gaps in the procession. Our staff will be supplying those vehicles with an orange safety sticker, which will be placed in your windshield, as well as it, some of the cars will receive a magnetic flag for on top of your vehicle. And if you are joining the procession, we ask that you go directly to your cars when the service is complete. 
The Shiva will be observed at the Glick Finnegan Residence, 2236 Lincolnwood Drive in Evanston, today following the interment until 9 p.m., Friday from 2 to 6 p.m., and Saturday evening from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. And just a reminder that Shiva attendees must be fully vaccinated, and the family also requests that individuals attending the Shiva test negative for COVID. And all this information is listed in the service folders that you received on your way in today, as well as the memorial contributions and some folders. We ran out of a little bit today, so we printed more, so they are available as you exit. The following people have been selected to serve as pallbearers. As I call your names, if you'll please step forward. Jake Contarado, Jesse Contarado, Ben Brown, Mac Perry, Tom Comerford, Noah Goldenberg, and as honorary pallbearers, Dean Contarado and Carrie Goldenberg. I'll ask everyone to please rise now as the casket is escorted.